Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Say that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see your face today here at the SSV. Like Ray said, my name is Gino Allison. I'm one of the pastors here. And as always, I want to welcome you to the South Suburban Vineyard Church. Special welcome to those who might be visiting, visiting us for the very first time uh, today. So glad to see brand new faces in the house. And as always, we want to welcome those of you who are watching us virtually, whether you're watching us live right now or on demand later. We thank you for being a part of our virtual audience. And as always, you're welcome to come and visit with us in person. Well, I don't know if it's officially summer yet, but summer, is it? Oh, summer is among us. The, the heat is telling us that it's summertime. And for as long as I can remember, uh, we've used the summer here at SSV, the summer months, uh, to have an extended conversation about relationships. I know a lot of you are new to the SSV, but for those of you who've been around a while, you know that it is our regular rhythm to take the summer months to talk about relationships for a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons is that relationships are one of the most significant aspects of our human lives together. We lean often at this church on the greatest commandment that God gave us, and that is to love God and to love people. You can't love God well without also loving people. And one of the outworkings of our love for God is how we care for the other human creation, the other people on this planet. And so because of that, it's wrapped up in why we're here, our purpose for even being on earth, we pause regularly to engage in a series on relationship because we believe that relationships are God's idea. And because relationships are so important, you can look throughout all scripture and there's plenty of instruction, plenty of encouragement, plenty of challenges toward us with regard to how we connect with other people. So there is a correlation between the quality of our life and the quality of our relationships. To take it a little bit deeper, there was a deep, uh, correlation between the quality of our life with God and the quality of our lives with people, our relationship with people. And so because it's so important, we have this rhythm of engaging it uh, each summer. And in the spirit of that, I begin a brand new teaching series this morning that I'm simply calling Words, Deeds, and Disposition. Words, Deeds, and and disposition. And one of the goals of this series is to help us understand just how much the quality of our relationships are shaped by the things we say, our words. The quality of our relationships are shaped by the things we do, our deeds or our actions. And the, the quality of our relationships are shaped by our attitude or our disposition. That's the, one of the main goals of this series as we jog through the various installments of this series. The Bible has a whole lot to say about this vital aspect of our lives, and I'm excited to dive in this, uh, this week. And so I want you to lean in and don't miss a single week of this series because it's so important. And so this conversation, as you can guess, is layered, it's multifaceted, it's deep, it's wide. And so as I was trying to figure out where we should start, I thought a good starting point for conversation, this important, this deep and layered, is that we would first start by talking about our attitude. We would start by talking about our attitude. Now, attitude is one of those words that has a whole lot of meaning depending on who's saying it and how they're saying it, right? My mom used to say, well, what you got an attitude for? And what she meant to say was, why is your attitude so bad? Like if somebody says you have an attitude, the implication is you have a bad attitude, but we all have an attitude, right? And our attitude is our manner, our disposition, our feeling, particularly with regard to a person or a thing or a situation. Our attitude is our tendency or our orientation, especially our orientation of the mind and emotions. Our attitude is a person's outlook and approach to life, including their inner thoughts that often lead to what? Outward expressions, right? Our attitudes are those deep inner thoughts and feelings that all, almost always give way to some type of outward expression. I love this quote by Pastor Charles Swindell. Swindell, he's a pastor, author, educator, and Charles Swindell says this, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. 
It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, make or break a church, make or break a home. He continues, the remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is what? Our attitude. He concludes, I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. Isn't that a rich quote? I love that he says the only thing we can do is play the, the one string we have. Imagine a guitar with one string on it. The only string you have the option to pay, play. The only thing you have real control over, not the actions or attitudes or dispositions or the words or deeds of others. The only thing we can fully control is what? How we show up. Our attitude. I love this quote and I love this subject even more because I'm convinced now more than ever that if we can get attitude right, a whole lot of other stuff will what? It will fall into place. I'll say that again. The older I get, the more I'm convinced that if I can get my attitude right, not not my wife's attitude as much as I try, if I can get my attitude together, she's not here by the way, um, (laughs) if I get my attitude together, a whole lot of other stuff will fall into play. And great coaches and recruiters for sports teams will tell you this, won't they? We got some coaches in the room. Skill is great. Talent, wonderful, right? But if that skill set and that talent is paired with a toxic attitude, the great coaches will pass on that player. They want to know if you're a good teammate, if you got hustle, if you're coachable, if you're teachable, or if you know everything already. Great coaches and recruiters want to know if you got a good, what, attitude, right? Ask the people who consistently recruit and hire great personnel, right? They will tell you that it's easier to teach and develop skills than it is attitude and character. And great recruiters will pass on a talented person if they have a terrible attitude. Any employers in the house today, those with successful dating histories will tell you (laughs) And when I say successfully, successful dating histories, I'm not talking about somebody who is currently with somebody because those with successful dating histories know that I would rather be by myself. That's success than to be with somebody who has a bad, what, attitude, immature, selfish, self-centered, self-important. I'd rather be by myself than to be coupled with somebody with bad attitude. Looks are great, resources are good, good job, that's excellent, but what about that attitude though? What about your guts? What about your inside? And those who have ignored that in their dating relationships have done so and regretted it. Those who have done so have done so at their own expense. I'm talking about attitude. Good parents know this too. Sure, a lot of our waking time and hours of energy is spent dealing with behaviors Stop that. Don't do that. Keep your hands to yourself. We're managing behaviors a lot of the time, but if we are wise, we are trying to disciple character, heart, the insides, the guts, the attitudes. I'm pa- I got four kids. I'm parenting attitudes every day. I got two teenagers now. It's attitudes all day long. And I asked their permission to talk about this this morning, right? Look, the the dad speeches, you know what I mean when I say dad speeches? They're getting longer and deeper right now, you know? Because the older my kids get, the more their character is being formed, the more it's my job and it's my duty to help develop who they are and who they're becoming. And tending to behaviors don't do the trick, not at this age, not at this stage. Oftentimes, I'm dealing with attitudes. So when I say, hey, man, somebody come in here and take this garbage out, and they got to pause the game, and I hear stomping feet and huffing and puffing, there's something with inside of me that just runs in there and says, hey, man, we got got a problem in here? (laughs) 
Man, when I tell you to do something, I don't want to hear that stomping and slamming things, man. I need the garbage out, right? So I could walk out of the room, but I've just dealt with the behavior. I didn't tend to the attitude. So I got to go back and I say, hey, man, everything you're wearing, somebody bought for you. Every place you went this week, somebody took you. The garbage is full because the stuff you ate that you didn't buy is in there. Me and your mother go to work every day, even when we don't feel like it. We got a few side hustles just to make your life comfortable. Your job is to do well in school and to do your chores around here. This is how you contribute to this family. So, man, when I tell you to take out the garbage, man, I don't want you stomping. I don't want you huffing the puppy. This is your job. This is how you play on Team Allison here. Man, am I, am I, am I, am I understanding? We have an understanding. You understand what I'm saying? Now, the first part of that conversation, I was tending to the actions, the behaviors, but the second part was more important because I was tending to what? The attitude behind those actions. That's what <laughs> the bulk of parenting is. Good parents understand that we're tending to attitude. The psalmist says in Psalm chapter 19, verse 14, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock, and my redeeming. When my wife uh, is taking the kids to school every day, she has them recite this, I think almost every day on their way to school because this is such an important verse in our house. And I love this verse because the psalmist couples the external actions, the things that we're saying, the things that we're doing with the inward stuff, and he's inviting God to take a look at it all, right? Sometimes we like to uncouple the two over focus on the thing that we're doing and saying all the externals and uncouple that from who we are and our heart. But smart people, mature people, people who are tending to their innards, knowing that their innards will impact their outward expressions, understand that the words of their mouth, the external expressions are just as important as the meditations of our hearts they all need to be pleasing to God. There is a connection. And because of that reason, I want to start this new series, this conversation, words, deeds, disposition, by focusing on attitude. And if you just need a title for this message this morning, I'm simply calling this message, Attitude is Everything. Attitude is everything. And I guess I should put a little asterisk by everything because it's not quite everything, but it's a whole lot. And so I think you get where I'm going with this. Attitude is everything. I want to look at a passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 2. Would you meet me there in your Bibles this morning? Philippians chapter 2. I want to start at verse 1. You can feel free to follow along if you um, want to follow along in a, in, a, in, a, in a paper Bible. There are paper Bibles on the edges of your rows. Feel free to use those to follow along with us. By the way, if you don't have a Bible at home that you understand and that you enjoy reading, feel free to take one of those Bibles home with you today as our gift to you. If you've been taking one every week, you don't take one every week. <laughs> And you can bring one back each week. Don't bring the whole stack. Just bring one back each week. And nobody will even know but Jesus. Amen? Um, paper Bible's there. We'll also uh, invite you to uh, follow along on your mobile devices. We'll also be projecting the words on the screens. Philippians chapter 2. Why you find that this morning, let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much for this opportunity this opportunity to be uh, in front of your people this morning, to be with your people, to study your word. God, you have some things to teach us. Um, at the top of the list this morning, you want to talk to us about our attitude, how we show up, how we're being experienced by others. And so, Lord, we, invite, we ask that you would teach us today. We're not too proud to learn today. We're not, um, we're not know-it-alls this morning. We confess our ignorance we confess that we all struggle with regard to how uh, our attitudes are experienced by others. And we say, Lord, teach us today. Put the mirror of your word in front of us and show us us. As you show us yourself today, would you also show us a reflection of who we are? And we know going into this that your intent, Lord, is not to condemn us, but to challenge us, to call us higher, to change us and to transform us. And so, so Lord, we res receive your instruction today. Lord, I ask that you would put power on these words you've given me to speak this morning. Would you move the preacher out of the way this morning so that your truth and your light might shine through. And Lord, if we've asked you for too little this morning, 
We pray that you would surprise us with your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. And so Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to start reading at verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul writing here. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Verse 3, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude. There's our word, the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Now, I really like this text for a lot of reasons. But one of the main reasons I like this text is because it's so applicable to almost all of our life together in the context of Christian community, especially in the context of our interpersonal relationship. Let me give you a little context about who's writing this and why. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. Interestingly enough, Paul is writing this letter while he sits in a Roman prison. He has a deep affection for the church at Philippi. They've supported him and been generous to him while he's been in prison. And so he has a deep affection for this particular church. And the primary goal of this letter is to encourage the Philippians to continue on as kingdom people, despite the obstacles, and to keep growing in their commitment to serve God and serve one another. I'll say that last part again. He wants them to keep growing in their commitment to serving God and serving one another. And so Paul starts off this chapter that we read today with a series of rhetorical questions. He's not looking for an answer because he already knows the answer to the questions. He asks them, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Are you encouraged because of your connection to Christ? Any comfort from his love? You get any comfort out of being in community and in fellowship with the living God? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Like he's not waiting for months for them to answer yes or no. Like he knows they get a whole lot out of being in community and in connection with Christ. And so he says, since you get a whole lot out of this, right? Paul says, do me a favor. Verse two, he says, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. Paul is saying, if you get anything out of being in Christ and you get a lot out of it, I need you to respond to God's goodness in this way. Because so much of how we respond to God's goodness toward us centers on how well we relate to the other humans. And some of us need to hear that again because we're down on our knees praying to God all day long, but we're rude to one another and different about the people who are image bearers, made in the image of God, of much worth and value. And I'll say it again, that so much of how we're supposed to respond to God centers on how well we relate to the other humans. So in response to all that God has given us, all that we get out of being in Christ, Paul said, love one another. And some of you say, okay, I can start there. Work together, Paul says. He said, okay, I can do that. Be of one mind and one purpose. That sounds a little hard, but I think I can do it. But then Paul says, agree wholeheartedly with one another. And that's where we hit the brakes. Because we're very different people of different sides of the tracks. And we say, Paul, you can't be asking us to agree with one another about everything. That can't be right. Well, make no mistake. Paul isn't asking us to agree with one another about everything. You can breathe, right? You can re-engage. But Paul is talking about unity in the faith. And so Paul is insisting that we minimally agree about the main things. The main things. The main things like Christ and him crucified. Christ and him resurrected and reigning. We got to agree about that. 
Paul is saying we have to agree about our call to continue Christ's ministry to the lost and the least through the power of the Spirit. There's no wiggle room. We got to agree about that, right? Paul is saying we have to agree about our commitment to be a great witness to the world for the sake of the mission. We have to agree about those things. And our greatest witness to the world isn't how much scripture we know. Our greatest witness to the world isn't how large our Bibles are. Some of us have large enough Bibles that we need little wheels for them. That's not the witness. The witness, Jesus says, is the world will know that you belong to me. How? By how you love one another how you prefer one another, how you defer to one another. That is our witness to the world. We have to agree on those main things. And I believe that Paul is suggesting that if we can agree on the main things, all the other stuff we can work out. Which is good to hear as we march toward uh, a very interesting presidential election. Uh, It's interesting to hear as we sit in the midst of a unique cultural moment where you can't slice the demographic pie into any more slices. We've never been more divided. If we can agree on the main things, church, as diverse as we are, the rest of the stuff, we can work it out. We can work it out. And so Paul, in this spirit, urges his church toward love. He coaches us toward love disposition, having the right posture, our, a great orientation toward other people. And he continues in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 by saying, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Anybody convicted yet? Anybody got an A on the test quite yet? My suspicion is that we're all in the same boat. We've all got work to do. But if that's not enough, I think I want to spend <laughs> the, most, the rest of our time on the second half of what Paul had to say in these few verses that I read today um, because I want to give you a couple pro tips on how to get this whole attitude business situated. We've been properly primed, but in the second half of this, Paul talks about our attitude, and I think I want to spend the rest of our time there. I want to give you two pro tips on how to calibrate the heart, the disposition, the attitude. You ready? I'm going anyway. The first one is to develop a vision for who you want to be. Develop a vision for who you want to be as it relates to your attitude. A vision, this vision is a picture of a preferred future. When we were planting this church, they said, you got to sit down and come up with a vision statement. And this vision statement is going to remind you of what, you're, what, what, you, what, you, what God told you and what you're trying to make into a reality. Get a picture of it in your mind so that it might inform your actions, so that it might inform what you're building for. And so this picture, this vision is a picture of our preferred future as it relates to the type of person we want to become with regard to our attitude and our disposition. Now, this is important because some of us, we're a little too general with this. We're a little too vague. I want to get better. I want to have a better attitude. I guess I've got a little work to do. That's a little too vague. I guess that's a good start. You've acknowledged that there's some work to do, but we got to get more specific. We need a bar to hit. We need a goal to ascend to. We need something to reach for. We need a composite sketch of who we are supposed to be like. And Paul gives us the cheat code. You want to get relationships right. You want to be experienced well. You want to have the right posture and disposition. Here's the answer key. Be like Jesus. Yeah, be like Jesus. Want to have the right attitude be like Jesus. In a way, he's saying it's not enough to study the words of Jesus. We love them red letters, don't we? Love to quote them. And that's good, but it's not enough to study the words he says. It's not enough to examine his deeds, the things he does. We love the character and the way Jesus lives and interacts with people. That's great. Study that. Fantastic. But it feels necessary to examine his attitude, 
the heart behind the things that he does, the heart that beat within him that pumps the proverbial blood to everything else feels necessary to study the heart. I don't think we talk about attitude enough, which is why ours is so bad. <laughs> if you don't have his attitude, you won't live out the kind of life that Jesus lived, period. Can I say it again? If you don't have Christ's attitude, his posture, his disposition, you won't consistently live the way he lived. Sure, you'll get it right, fits and spurts. My dad used to say a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> but you won't consistently live the life you're supposed to live without the heart that was in Christ. So Paul wants to make sure we get this. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Don't, but, but, but instead, be humble. Think of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests. And you say, I'm starting to get the picture. But he drills down on it in verse 5. He said, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, period. And he fleshes this out for us in verses 6 through 8. He said, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. What does Paul do? He sets the bar real high because he needs to. Because if it was left on us, we would grade ourselves on the most generous curve that anybody has ever used to grade something. Our approach to setting a bar is we find a scoundrel that we are better than, and we say, well, at least I'm not like that guy. At least I'm not like David. I'm just picking on you, Pastor David, because we go way back. You find somebody that you're beating, and you say, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. I could do worse. And Paul knows that that doesn't get us to the good life. That doesn't help us to be the witness that we're supposed to be a witness, the attractive, winsome fragrance of Christ. Paul's, Paul knows that that doesn't get us there, just finding somebody that you're slightly better than. And so he comes out swinging and he sets the bar high. He says, the bar is Jesus. In case you're curious, in case you hadn't heard the gospel or this part of the gospel, that God was in heaven and sent his son down to earth to be a human so that he might die for us and take on the price and penalty of all our sin and die on the cross. But before he would get to die on the cross, he would have to put up with the other humans, right? He was in heaven one moment, and in an instant, he's on earth. What a downgrade. And though he could lay hold, and lay hold to all the privileges of being God, all the power and perks of being God, when he came down on mission, he decided not to so that he might fulfill his purpose that he might purchase our salvation through his blood and his suffering for us. This is the good news. This is our inheritance. This is what we received, but this is what Christ has done. And so lacking any measure of self-importance, not demanding his own way, not pulling the guard, trump card, he humbles himself to obedience, even unto death. Paul says, that's the attitude you should have. Now, instantly, the big red marker comes out and gives us an F on the paper because we don't currently measure up to that. I know I don't. Paul said, this is the bar. This is the attitude you should have. When you get a picture in your mind of the perverted future for your life and for your attitude and how you're supposed to show up in the world and be experienced, don't think of the nicest person you know. Think about Jesus as the gold standard. As much as it pains me to say it, as much as work that it's going to take for me to ascend to this bar, I must say I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. 
Anybody in your heart of hearts say, man, I know that's a tall order, but I want to be like Jesus. I realize in, that, in this moment that Jesus is the bar. Now, if you're leaning in this direction, I want to warn you that this kind of proactivity requires a great deal of vulnerability, a great deal of honesty, and a great deal of self-awareness because it demands that we reckon with who we presently are. Our current state, our current attitude and disposition, and some of us don't even want to think about it because we know, we know we're not who we're supposed to be. Well, you, know, you were cutting up just this morning on the way over here. You had a bad attitude. You got a bad attitude right now. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, ask the person you came with. They'll tell you about your attitude. But if you're going to dabble in this, if you're going to engage the bar that is Jesus, it requires us for us to do some, some, some work on assessing who and where we are right now. Because we like to grade ourselves in the moments where things are going well. In a moment where everybody's nice to you. Well, they fill your fries up at, you know, Chick-fil-A and, and they, the, the barista gets your order right. Like, you want to measure yourself there. Like, when you're sleeping, you want to measure your attitude at that moment. But I think we're tasked this morning with asking ourselves, who are we and how do we show up and what's our disposition in our worst moments? Who, who am I in my worst moments? Let me put it to you this way. I, I like to think of myself as generally cool, generally calm, uh, generally co uh, collected, right? Uh, uh, kind of unflappable, generally speaking. And I'm usually even, I'm usually calm, I'm usually collected, I'm usually comfortable unless a, a cicada lands on me. <laughs> I've almost crashed my car twice this week <laughs> because of these bugs. I'm just driving, minding my business. I got a window down. That's your first mistake. And a cicada flies in the window and it takes every ounce of to c control the wheel and not to swerve into oncoming traffic. Anybody experience this this week? We, we let the windows up and we're driving, me and Joe, and we're driving, everything's calm, and we just hear this bzzz. <laughs> And all of a sudden, right there, on the and then of course we have to regain control again. I'm walking through the parking lot, calm and collected, and, and a cicada, I must look like a big brown tree to them. <laughs> And I'm telling you, I'm normally a cool guy. But if a cicada is in my immediate vicinity, I just completely turn into a three-year-old child. <laughs> and after the brush with death is over, I t usually have to look around and see how many people witnessed my shame. <laughs> say, preacher, why are we talking about cicadas? Because I think it's a perfect illustration of like, you can be calm one moment, and then life's version of a loud, buzzing cicada lands on you and you become somebody else. And all that calmness and all that Holy Ghost goes out the window when you have a proverbial cicada moment. Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true, right? And so I have to reckon and not grate myself on my attitude when I'm asleep or all the kids are gone or me and the wife are getting along. All my employees are doing just what they're supposed to do. I got to see who am I like in those cicada moments? What are the things and who are the people? What are the places? What are the circumstances where I'm just not my best? Because while there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, your worst moments are still your moments. That's still you. That's, that's still you. You are not defined solely by your worst moments. I want to be clear about that. But it's still yours to deal with. 
And I found that when I start to examine who I am in my ugliest moments, and I start to do a work on those situations or those particular triggers, then I'm really getting somewhere with, with regard to my general disposition, you see? And so if you were asked me, Pastor Allison, what, what, what are your cicada moments? What are your triggers that throw you into bad attitude? Honestly speaking, my triggers are other people's bad attitudes. <laughs> That there's something about a bad attitude that triggers a bad attitude for me. When you're wrong and you aren't acting like you're wrong, like something on the inside of me comes apart. And somehow I grant, my, per, per, grant myself permission to meet your attitude with an even stronger one. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And maybe your cicadas are, are, are circumstances surrounding your marriage or circumstances surrounding your children or circumstances surrounding your employer or your teacher or your boss or your neighbor. Or maybe it's circumstantial whenever you feel anxious or whenever the money is low or you feel insecure or threatened. You get into a place or that bad attitude wells up. I mean, I can't tell you what your thing is. You gotta be honest with yourself. But if we don't get a picture of what the preferred future looks like and do some work of assessing, honestly assessing who we are and how we're presently experienced by other people, we won't do this work well. And so maybe some homework for you in this particular realm is ask the people you live with how they experience you, how you show up, or ask them what your triggers are, right? Because they'll tell you. So every time we get to talking about money, we meet a different version of you. <laughs> get a vision of your preferred future person that you want to be. Second thing, second pro tip is to let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Now, this is super important. It doesn't directly flow from the text, but if Christ is our example, if he is the bar, then the Spirit within us will help us live the life that Jesus lived. The indwelling spirit that Jesus promised when he went away, you remember he said it to his disciples, listen, I know you're sad that I'm going away, but you need me to go away. You should want me to go away because when I go, I'm going to leave with you what? The Holy Spirit. I'm going to leave with you a helper, the indwelling power and presence of the spirit that will testify to truth, that will convict you of sin, that will whisper in your ear, and calibrate your heart and calm you down when you need to be calmed down, get you right when you need to get, be get right. You said, you need me to go because I will leave with you the helper, the spirit. And so in Galatians 5, Paul gives us a mini intensive on what it means to let the spirit guide our lives. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature uh, wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. This is really, really helpful for us today. Paul is letting us know that you don't have a bad attitude because you're a terrible person. You're not showing up and being experienced poorly, and you're not landing awkwardly on people because you're a bad person or because you're an idiot or whatever. Paul is saying there is a real war raging on the inside of you, even right now, as you listen to me, as your soul and spirit are trying to figure out what to do with all this information, how to process this stimulus, there is a war going on on the inside of you right now. A war between what? Darkness and light. Warring right now. Darkness and light. Flesh and spirit are at battle right now. These forces are already, all, always at work. 
And Paul lets us know how we know which force we're yielding to. Verse 18, he says, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. And he gives us a list. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's quite a list, isn't it? It just hit just about everybody in the room, didn't it? And I'm struck by how, how wide and how varied that list is. It deals with the ex, ex, external things we do. Sexual immorality, drunkenness, wild parties, outburst of anger and quarreling. But it also deals with quite a few internal things as well. Envy, selfish ambition, idolatry, jealousy, right? External and internal. The psalmist knows this, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, he couples those together because they're all a byproduct of what? This war that's going on inside us, they are, they are the fruit of what happens when we live according to our flesh rather than live according to the spirit. When we give in to the sinful, fallen, broken nature rather than being people of the spirit, this is what happens. It envelops our whole being, inside, then out. Corrupts us internally, and the outworking of that are these behaviors and many, many more. The good news is that the Spirit, if you live into it, the Spirit, if you yield to it, does the same thing. It coats the inside and works its way out. Verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of the sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. What? a list. This sure gives us a lot to think about, doesn't it? Especially as it relates to our attitude, our disposition, and how we're showing up, how we're being experienced by others. This helps us to focus less on our behaviors and reactions to all the triggers and focus more on what? The inner life. Life in the spirit. Noting that the presence of a bad attitude and poor responses to all the triggers typically signal an absence of the fruit of the indwelling, indwelling spirit of God in my life and in your life. I'll say that again. We note that the presence of a bad attitude and poor responses to all the triggers of life typically signal the absence of the fruit of the indwelling spirit of God in my life. He said, I just need a new boss. Maybe, but you need more of the spirit. <laughs> Try the spirit and you might keep that job because you just might show up different. Well, Lord, we'll just do a work in my spouse. I'll be all right. Uh, actually, maybe, but you might just need a little more Holy Ghost. It, it, let's start there and see if things don't change, right? I just need more money and then I'll show up better. Wait, wait, wait. let's try more spirit, Holy Spirit first. And the fruit that is produced through living into the Spirit and your circumstances might not change and the people around you might not change, but God is far more interested in changing us than he is in changing our circumstances. I've learned that the more I walk with Jesus. I need more of the Spirit. I need more joy in my life to counteract this depression and sadness. I need peace to offset this anxiety that I feel about everything. I need patience when well, these kids have got me right on the edge. I need kindness when I'm rude and short. 
I need goodness when I'm self-absorbed and I'm the center of my own universe. I need faithfulness when people are experiencing me as unreliable, flaky, and indifferent about letting others down. I need gentleness when I'm harsh and brusque, aggressive, and nasty. I need gentleness. I need self-control because my life is just happening to me. I'm reacting to everything. Words are just jumping out of my mouth without being filtered through my heart and mind that is impacted by the Spirit. I need some self-control because I'm a mess. We're a mess. All these virtues, all these virtues flow flow from a life-giving connection with the Spirit of God. So that the same heart that was in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, would also be in us because it's the same spirit. The same spirit. And the same power that rose Jesus from the the grave is living in us, not so that we can just speak in tongues and run around the church and get sweaty. We get sweaty in here. You can speak in tongues in here. You can do all that. But like the spirit wants you to be nice to people. And show up to work on time. And give your boss an honest day's work and put your cart back at the grocery store like the Spirit. (laughs) The Spirit wants you to put your cart back and stop stop scanning the regular apples and taking home the fancy apples at the (laughs) shelf checkout. You know them Honeycrisp apples. You know the code for those. And I get it. Honeycrisp apples are like $3 a bite. But like the Holy Spirit wants you to scan the right stuff and like stop stealing at the self-checkout, right? We come out of the clouds a little bit. The Spirit will help you show up well and apologize when you're wrong to your children and show them what it looks like to be a whole person. Show them what it looks like to be regulated and balanced so they don't have to wonder which version of daddy's waking up this morning. Which version of my spouse is coming home from work? Which version of Pastor Gino am I going to get this Sunday? And what the Spirit will do is regulate you so that you are a whole person. Not perfect, but if Jesus is the bar, the power of the Spirit will help us reach that bar. And we will never, ever attain it on this side of heaven, but we will never be done working. Never be done stretching. Never be done pressing toward that mark. Who am I talking to today? Some of y'all, judging by the amen, some of us got some work to do. And that's all right. Worship team, you can come up as we put this all together. Paul is saying, you want to get relationships right, have the same attitude as Christ. And his attitude's marked by what? Humility. He's wholly unentitled. not self-important, sacrificial in love, obedient to God, even unto death. And so our job as we leave this place today is to examine honestly what are the things, what are the people, what are the places, what are the scenarios that are keeping us from having a great attitude that honors God and blesses other people. What are they? Who are they? We got to do that work first, right? What are my triggers? What are those cicadas that land on me and cause me to lose my mind? We got to do that work. And then we got to start asking if Jesus is the bar, if I'm supposed to be like Jesus, if that's the person I'm supposed to be, then situationally, especially in those moments where I'm prone to miss it, where I have a history of showing up as differently than I want to show up, you might ask yourself, How would the person I want to be respond to this situation? 
Here we are in this meeting and Sheila has taken credit for my work again. How would the person I want to be handle this? We can say, well, what would Jesus do? But that's a little too, like if, if I'm striving to be like Jesus and Jesus helps me to form the preferred future for my life, who I want to be, how would that person respond in this particular moment? How would the person who I want to be respond in this moment? You, you can't do that unless you slow down a little bit, you know? I had a friend named Scott, and Scott talked real slow. And one day we were talking, and Scott said, I talk real slow because before I came to Jesus, I, I used to curse a lot. He said, I realized if I didn't talk slower, certain words would just tumble out. And so now I talk slow. And I wonder uh, how much of this real work would just require us to slow down and think and say, as my mom would often say, help me, Holy Ghost. You hear my mom say, help me, Holy Ghost. That means somebody was right you got this close to just losing it. She said, help me, Holy Ghost. And I wonder if this week you would say, help me, Holy Ghost. To respond the way I'm supposed to respond, to show up the way I'm supposed to show up, to not let these triggers win, to be guided and led, anchored by the indwelling spirit. Come Holy Spirit. And finally, I think that the challenge for us this week will be to identify people in your world who, who seem to be getting it right. Right? You need some new heroes, like people that you could touch and feel. People wouldn't be perfect, but you say, man, when it comes to the area I'm weak, that person really seems to be getting it right. Maybe I'll invite them to speak into this. Maybe I might interrogate them as to how they've managed to do this. Maybe some of you might need some new heroes. Living, breathing people that might help you be who God's calling you. I might guess the Spirit is working on you even now to give you more opportunities to be more like Jesus, to calibrate that attitude, that disposition. And our job is to let him. Amen? Would you stand with me as we, as I pray and as we enter into a time of uh, worship, uh, final song, and let me pray. Lord, we yield to you. We ask you to continue to calibrate our hearts and to make us who you want us to be. We recognize that we are far from where we need to be and we know the only way we can get there is with your help. We've tried it our way with little to no success. And so we ask that you would make new wine out of us. It'll involve some crushing, some pressing. But this juice is worth the squeeze, amen? And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and do a work in us? And as we worship you, Lord, would you continue to till the soil of our heart so that you can do what you want to do? We ask all these things in Jesus' name.